Bridge Church. Chase coming at you guys here, continuing our grace series here at the bridge, okay? So in the very first week, we talked about the the of grace, okay? We talked about foundational stuff, of where grace came from, how it relates to works, and lots of awesome stuff like that, okay? And then in our second week, we talked about how grace is generous, okay? How we should give grace anytime, every time, okay? And then last week, uh, last week we talked about the R of grace, which is how it is required, how it's important, how we all need it, okay? Well, today we're continuing our grace anagram, G-R-A-C-E. This week we're on week four, so it's the A, and the A in this anagram stands for admirable, how grace is admirable. So I know what you may be thinking, now Chase, what exactly does that mean? How exactly is that supposed to work? You couldn't have picked like amazing grace and wrote a message about that, or you couldn't have picked awesome grace and done something about that. Well rest assured we're going to talk a lot about how awesome and how amazing grace is today, but I really felt the pull of God to talk about how admirable grace is is okay and the reason that is is because in i've noticed in my life and a lot of different things and christianity as a whole i feel like whenever the topic of grace comes up or forgiving others or anything like that we always reach for the exact same conclusion and we could see that as i talked about last week where peter goes to jesus and he says lord how many times am i supposed to forgive my brother is it seven times 70 times and jesus says assuredly i say to you it is not seven or 70 times but seven times 70 times right and I think that a lot of people's innate instinct is to know when grace stops, is to know, okay, when have I done my due? When can I officially, like, you know, cut this off and move on and do other things or, you know, not have to be as merciful as I always have to be, okay? Well, today we're addressing that. We're addressing this point of giving grace even when it may not be deserved or may not be earned and exactly how to feel about that or what your responsibility is about that, not just in your immediate circle, but also in the circles connected to yours, so to speak, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and talk about that today. Before we go too far, I first have to bring in our text scripture for this series, all right? It's in Ephesians chapter four, verse seven. And it says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift, okay? Now, I always wanna start every message in this series with this, as you guys have probably noticed by now, because I think it focuses Grace. It focuses where grace comes from, why it works, and most importantly, why we need it and why it is admirable, okay? So let me ask you guys this quick question of when someone, when someone gives you a gift, how do you feel about it? Do you feel like, oh, pff, a gift, great. Or are you like, hey, this is really cool. I really enjoy this. This is awesome. You probably are excited about it, right? Now let me ask you, what if someone you know gives someone you don't know a gift? Your feelings are a bit more neutral, right? You're not as invested, you're not as deep into it, right? Well, I feel like that's a very natural human tendency, you know? Whereas I feel like God calls us to a very Christian, very loving, very excitable life, so to speak, all right? So I think that this perfectly focuses in on that idea of how grace is to overflow in our lives, how we are to give grace to people we may not have even heard of or ever met before in our lives, okay? So to continue on that gravy train, I want to look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. It says this, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Okay? Now, look at that first part of the verse again. Verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I know what you may be thinking, especially if you've been watching this series. Hang on a minute, Chase. You said in a message a little bit ago that grace isn't like a jug of water, that you could parcel it out and give it to other people, or you could be given more of it. It's like a light switch, that you either have it or you don't, you're giving it or you don't. And I'm here to say, yes, that is exactly what I said. I'm super glad you remember. And that's still exactly on topic of what we're talking about. But Peter is saying to grow in grace, which to me means that you're adding lights to your already existing light, okay? So you flip the switch, the lamp on the ceiling comes on, right? But then you plug in another, out you plug in like a lamp into another outlet and you have another. And then you plug in another and another and another. It's more grace, more grace to other things in your entire life, okay? So to get saved, you need that initial grace, all right? That's what we're going to call it for now, initial grace grace to get saved. And then after you get saved, God wants you to give grace to the people immediately surrounding you, like the people in your immediate circle, like 
your family, your friends, you know, all the stuff like that, right? And then there's another level of grace after that, which is giving grace to people who you've never met, who don't know, and things like that, okay? These are like three different levels of grace that you grow into, all right? So you grow into those, and as you grow into those, the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, grows as well, okay? So the closer you get to God, the more you reflect his heart, the more you overflow in this grace, all right? This is all a lot of stuff we've talked about previously in this series, so I want you guys to just keep tracking with me here, all right? Let grace grow. Let this grace grow in you and extend it to all those other people, okay? And then another important thing is that as this grace grows, to just let it grow. And it's important to let it grow because what often happens is when someone does something against you guys or when they come in and do something, like if someone hits you while you're in traffic or if somebody like cuts you off or something like that, right? That the enemy will use that to try to get you further from God, to try to get you to do things that God doesn't want you to do or that you may not feel like you need to do, okay? And the devil is trying to get you to cut off those relationships and to try to get in your way, so to speak. Okay? And we can see this clearly in Ephesians again. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, where it says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. So in this we can see that grace can be given to other people and that it can be imparted. And that Paul is specifically saying here to impart grace to the hearers, to give grace to the hearers, okay? So I encourage you guys, whenever you're in a situation like that with somebody you may not know or somebody you do know or something like that, if somebody does something against you, to impart grace to them, okay? And I imagine you got all these different questions that are coming up in your mind like, oh, hey, what if they don't deserve it? Or what if they are not apologizing? Or what if, what if, what if? Well, I got good news for you guys today. Today we're going to discuss that a lot in this message, okay? So right now we're talking about the different levels of grace, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go on. But to fully understand grace, we're eventually going to have to look at some biblical examples of God showing grace. Because obviously, how can we know how best to show grace to the people around us and the next people if we don't know how God does it to the people around him? Okay? And then lastly, we're going to look, zoom back into the practical relational aspect. A lot of what we're talking about in this message is more person to person, not necessarily God to people. Okay? Okay? So go ahead and just stick with me on that one. But before we get too far, I first have to bring up 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. And it says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God has given us all the gift of grace, and he wants us to be good stewards of that grace. Now, a good steward in the Bible often means that you make good use of what you've been given. All right? That... Like the parable of the talents, so to speak, where a person was given a lot, and so they invested it and brought it back a hundred times more, okay? And I, Paul is saying here to be good stewards of that grace, to sow that grace wherever you can, that whenever you see an opportunity to show grace, to just go all out and give it. Like we talked about in a message a couple weeks back, of always going that extra mile, how grace is always pushing to go further and further and further for the sake of others. Because that's what Jesus did in his life, and that's what God wants us to do in our lives, all right? So this is basically what grace means, or what be, grace being out of means, is that God is pleased when we show grace in any circumstance or in all circumstances, okay? And to further emphasize this, to further talk about this, I want to look at some biblical examples of grace, okay? And you can, <laughs> some of these are a little off, but just stick with me through them, okay? Because the first one I want to look at is in Genesis chapter 3. Now, I know what you guys may be thinking, that this is the unpleasant part of the Bible. Like, you read chapter 1, you read chapter 2, you hear God creating things, you hear of Adam naming things. Things are on a pretty good gravy train up to this point. But then the serpent shows up, Eve bites the apple, Adam bites the fruit, you know, everything goes downhill pretty quick. And this is when we meet in chapter 3. I want you guys to specifically look at that back section there. I'm not going to break it down because it's way too long. This entire message will be dedicated to it. But I want you guys to focus in these last three paragraphs here. And I want you guys to look at who God addresses first. The sin has been brought out to the open. God has said, who told you that you were naked? And Adam said, 
uh, my wife asked me to do this, and Eve says the serpent told me to do this, and then as God is looking at it, who does he address first in this whole like chain? He addresses the serpent. He addresses the one who, he addresses the sin. He doesn't address Adam, the man who was responsible. He doesn't address Eve, the one who brought it in. He addresses the serpent. He addresses the sin. And I think that's super important in a Christian's life. That when someone like cuts you off in traffic, or when someone like deliberately goes against you, or deliberately does something that makes you super mad, just like, oh, why'd you do that? It's important to remember that we are called to give grace to the person and to not let the sin override the person, so to speak, if that makes sense. That you're looking at the sin as the problem, not the person. Not like, why do you always do this? Why are you like this? That's a very condemning, very legalistic, very harsh attitude. And that's very against the heart of God. The heart of God says, we can do better. You ask me to walk with you to a mile, I'll go with you too. You want my shirt? Take my coat also. This is a grace mentality. Not a, what have you done? How dare you do this? How could you possibly come near me like this? Okay? So I want you guys to keep that in focus today. And then the next verse I want to look at is in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 13 to 14. Again, not another great example of awesome things happening here. So David is king. This is Israel in its peak, so to speak. David is king. His armies are, you know, winning all the battles they go out to do. So he sends them away, and he decides he's going to take a day off just chilling home, right? And then he looks across, sees a lady bathing on the roof, and he's like, hey, I want to, I want to see that girl. I want to get to know her. And then all this bad stuff happens. And this is towards the tail end of that. Uriah, uh, Bathsheba's husband, has been killed. David, like, knows that something has gone wrong. And so God has sent Nathan, his prophet, to David, and he says this. Verse 13. So David said to Nathan... I have sinned against the Lord. David is repenting. Because David, again, I say this all the time, God is a man, not God, David, excuse me, is a man after God's own heart. He knows what God wants, he knows why he wants it, and he knows how to accomplish it. But he sees that he has done wrong. And so he is saying, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. This is an example of Old Testament grace. Of God saying, you have every right to be killed for this. You have sinned. I am a just God. I have every right to strike you down. But I have put away your sin. Again, God is addressing the sin. He's not addressing the person. Because God... Being the ultimate, awesome, amazing, loving, just being he is, knows that sin is the problem and not the person. He sees the problem for what it is, not what it immediately looks like. And it's super important to remember that whenever you're dealing with anyone, okay? But we got another verse, and it's in verse 14. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the child who is born to you shall surely die. Now that's harsh. And a lot of people read that and say, how does that fit with the Jesus and the Gospels? That's a tough question. And here's how. God will give you grace. God will forgive you under any circumstance. But there are still consequences for your actions. Giving grace doesn't wipe those out. So God will love you and carry you through anything you ever go through. But you're still going to have to go through it. And I think as Christians, we need to remember that giving grace to someone isn't excusing their actions. It's forgiving them, but there are still consequences and still things that happen because of it. All right? But the greatest example of grace, the biggest one I want to talk about, the one that all other examples pale in comparison to, and if you only hear one of these, hear this one, okay? It's in John chapter 8. It's in verse 1, and it goes through 11. It goes like this. Now Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Great start. 
Now early in the morning he came again into the temple. Then all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. This was an average day for Jesus. He goes, he teaches the people. This is Jesus' ministry on the earth. This is what he's here to do. This is exactly what Jesus lives for. He's teaching, okay? Just another average day. The disciples are there. People are listening. He's in the temple. All is great. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. You know, the Pharisees always got to ruin something. They always got to show up with something. And when they had set her in the midst. I want to stop right there. Remember what I said. How God focuses on the sin, not the person. If the Pharisees actually cared about this particular instance, they could have come to Jesus privately and said, hey, we have this woman who's been caught in the act of adultery. What do we do? But that's not what it's about. It's not about actually seeking forgiveness or actually seeking guidance. They don't have a heart of grace. They have a heart of legalism. So they throw her in, make a big old show of this thing that she's done. And they say, this woman has sinned. It's about the person. It's not about the sin. With God, it's the reverse. It's about the sin, not the person. And that is truly the heart of God. God loves you so much, he's never going to let your sin define you. Whereas a traditional, religious, legalistic idea says that your sin will always define you. You have to work to get that debt off. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. The very act. We're now in verse 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Now, if they know what they're supposed to be doing, why are they asking Jesus? Why is Jesus being brought in on this matter that the teachers of the law are very well educated in? It's like a rocket scientist not knowing how to light a fuse, so they bring in like some guy off the street. Why are you asking me? The Bible explains. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. The Pharisees are just trying to trap Jesus. This isn't even about the person. It's about clarifying their own image. Because remember, Jesus had said that the scribes and Pharisees won't inherit the kingdom of God. They are the ones who are deceiving and lying and trying to earn their way into heaven, okay? And the Pharisees don't like that, so they're trying to get rid of them. They're trying to shut them up. So Jesus sees that this is very much a trap, but what does he say? But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. Theologians the world over have speculated on what Jesus was writing in this ground, and truly, we don't know. But a couple of the ideas are that Jesus is writing the names of all the men standing there, showing that he knows them better than they know him. Another idea is that he's writing the books of the law, proving that he knows the law better than they do. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, this is one of the most important things, a super important thing, a thing that to me is the cure to legalism, is the cure to thinking that anyone is better than anyone else. And it goes like this. He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Jesus isn't excusing what the woman has done. He's not saying she's innocent, let her go. He's not giving cheap grace. A lot of people will object to that and say, you're just letting them go on sinning because you're too weak to actually like stand up and hold that firm, righteous holiness thing or whatever. That's not what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is calling all of them. He's saying, okay, you caught her in sin. Good job. How many of you are without sin now? How many of you have the ability to... Stone this woman in good conscience, knowing that you were not in the same position once. Because Jesus knows that there is a point in everyone's life where they're the one called out on the carpet. Where they're the one publicly shamed by everybody. You want to know how Jesus knows that, that person? Because he was that person. The Bible tells us that standing on that cross, Jesus was reviled. People hurled all kinds of names at him, did all kinds of stuff to him. Jesus was the shame one. That's why he knows what it's like. And so he says, how many of you can in good conscience throw a stone at her? Verse 8. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, going back to his business. Then those who heard it 
being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman was standing in the midst. When you have Jesus, he'll be with you no matter what. No matter who's accusing you, Jesus will be there, and you let him be there. That is what grace gives you. That is what grace grants you, is this uh, ability to have an ally and a best friend in every tragedy, in every circumstance. But notice what Jesus says here. Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman. He said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Just like with Peter in the denials that we talked about, this isn't Jesus like confirming something. This is Jesus looking at the woman and helping her to have confidence in herself again. He's saying, is anyone condemning you? And this goes back to Genesis 3, where God looked at Adam and said, who told you you were naked? Again, Jesus is looking at the sin, not the person. Jesus is looking at where the actual problem is. And not just what's right in front of him. Verse 11, she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Cheap grace just says, hey, God loves you. Live your life. Live your best life. That's cheap grace. Actual grace is I love you and I'll be with you through anything, but go and sin no more. Hear my heart and follow my ways. That is what God wants. That grace changes you so fundamentally on every single level, spiritually and physically and everything, that you are not craving the same things you were anymore. Because God has taken root in your heart and you naturally flow in these things. And the Holy Spirit naturally approves you in these things. It's not a legalism, like, I want to do this, but I can't kind of thing. It's a, God doesn't want me to do this, so I'm not going to. It's chasing after the heart of God. It's that fire of love that God lights in you to pursue him. All right? And I think it's easy to have that touchy-feely, feel-good Jesus. You know? And I've said this a million times before, but sin is a big deal. Sin matters. It's not something that you just let slide idly by or just pay no attention to and just ignore. It's important. You can't have sin and God in the same space. Just like I talked about last week, you have these two paths set before you. One of God and grace, one of sin and pain. Which one you go is up to you. God doesn't like sin. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35 says, Vengeance is mine and recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. God is talking about those who have deliberate, who have seen the way and go a different way. Now, this message isn't meant to condemn you. That's not at all what my goal is here. That's not at all what my objective is here. But I need to stress to you that sin can't be taken casually. Sin is, as a Christian, sin is our enemy. It's the thing we have to avoid at all costs. We'll look at that a little bit more later. But the reason it's so important is because 1 Samuel 2, 2 says, No one is holy like the Lord. There is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. Our God is a rock. He'll protect and provide for you through anything. But to have that rock, you've got to stay with him. And sin tries to pull you away from that. It tries to get you to step out away from where God is. Sin feels good in the moment, but it is out to get you. It is out to pull you away from God. And you have to let it go. You have to push it away. You have to stick with God. And it's hard to do. It's a genuine hard life to live. Which is why, if you see someone struggling in that, if you're a Christian and you see someone struggling in any way, whether it be with sin, whether it be with secret place time, whether it be with whatever, help them. Christianity isn't meant to be a solo gig. It's meant to be in fellowship together. 
These verses say so. In John chapter 15, verse 12, I thought about starting the whole message with this. It says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. This verse always hits me hard because it's so, it portrays the Bible so clearly. Old Testament, this is my commandment. New Testament, that you love. How does that work? Because you can't force someone to love someone. It doesn't work that way. So how do you command to love? These two thoughts aren't compatible. But with God, they are. Because to an outsider looking in, it's like they're loving because they've been told to. And it's like, no, I just love because that's how hard I love. Because I see the model. I see what Jesus did. And I have to do the same for others because I don't have any choice. Not because I'm forced to or I'm pushing myself to, but because I see what Jesus did and I have to do the same. It's really hard to explain, but you got to know deep in your heart that you have to pursue. Not because you're afraid of what's behind you, but because you adore what's in front of you. Now, like I had said, it's important to not excuse sin in a person's life. Love them, yes, but tell them the truth too. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Look, the wording here is super specific. May grow up. Paul talks about this later in another book. He says, I put off the old ways and adopted the new. This is exactly the exact same thing that Paul is addressing. Your old life, your sin life, that you were a child, that you didn't know any better, that you bought into, let it go now. Because you are in the new way. You know better. You see what it costs you and take on the new way. Grow up into all that Christ is. Not because you have to or because you're feeling forced to or because you're feeling pushed to. Because if you don't, then God's not going to let you into heaven or something like that. But because you genuinely feel the love of God and you want other people to feel that love too. Think of it like a campfire that's so warm and you see all these people shivering around you. You just got to bring them in. Bring them close to it so they can feel its warmth too. And Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 through 2 says this perfectly. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, if he stumbles in anything, you who are spiritual, you who are safe, you who can see what is going on, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. How many of you need a spirit of gentleness in your life? Amen. A spirit of gentleness is not an easy thing to have, nor is it as easy to understand as a lot of people think. Because I think a lot of people rush to the idea of just thinking, like, hey, you know, if you can stop that, you know, that'd be great. But how many of you know, there comes a time when you need to be, like, upfront and honest with that person and say, you're doing something wrong. What you're doing is bad. It takes a boldness to say that. And sometimes there's a time, and sometimes you need to say that. But what Paul is saying here is that that's not every time. And more importantly... When that time comes, be gentle with it, even in that time. How Jesus would handle them, handle them. Again, not excusing, not excusing what, sin, but flowing in grace. Focusing on where the problem actually is, like God does, and not just seeing it immediately, seeing like a one plus one equals two. And then say, okay, you take one out, then it must equal one. No, look at it deeper than that. I just used a math analogy. That's gross. But hear what I'm saying, okay? Some more verses I got for that are in Luke chapter 6, verse 36. It says, therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. God has loved us abundantly. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. And it's the exact same for us. God has lit the fire of love deep within us. And he wants us to pursue it. He wants us to chase after it. He wants us to run with everything we have. And here's something. If you're not to that point yet, if you can't run, so you gotta like jog, or you gotta like, you know, baby step it, that's fine. We don't all grow at the same speed. There's no like benchmark of you have to be this far by this point in your Christian walk. That's not true. 
If showing grace for you is just keeping quiet when that guy cuts you off in traffic, great. But don't stay there. If that's where you are right now, great. But at a future season and another point, you should be growing. Grace should grow in you. Because God plants us like trees. And trees, when they're healthy, grow. And they bear fruit. And that's what God wants from us. Matthew 5, 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, I talked about this a lot in the required uh, message earlier, but I want to address it again here. Don't do this for legalism. Don't give grace because you feel like you're not going to get it if you don't. Because that's not how it is at all. I'll give you grace. You just have to ask for it. Don't give grace because you're scared of what will happen if you don't. Because that is the devil coming in and trying to wreck something that's amazing. <laughs> There's your amazing grace right there. But grace, I think, is the absolute heart of God. Without grace, I struggle to see the Bible in a beneficial light. Because it is the heart of God. It is the whole goal of it. In order to see God in the mirror that he wants you to see him in, you need grace. And then lastly, in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, it says, For sin shall have no dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. The law says you do this or you go to jail. You do this or you suffer in afterlife. Whereas grace says, as I have loved you, love others. The tones and the people asking it are very different. And the goals are very different as well. And God wants you to overflow in love, to grow in grace, and then to have grace, I like to think of it kind of like a fountain on top of another fountain, if that makes sense. That you have so much water at the top that it naturally overflows to the next level. And then there's so much water there, it overflows to the next level. And then again, and again, and again. Where you are in that fountain is up to you. That's between you and God and no one else. But, great, but God so overflows in grace that he gave it to us, and we should overflow as well. But Chase, I hear you say, what if I don't have that initial grace? What if my light switch isn't on? So how can I have all these other lights if my light switch isn't even on? Or what if you say, my switch was on, but I turned it off and walked away? We could fix that. Or if you say, hey Chase, I have some physical need. We here at the Bridge Church are so ready to help you. We want to do life together. We see someone in need, we help them. So if you have physical need, text 801-391-6969 with your name and your need, and we'll take care of you. You're at the Bridge Church. We do that. And then for the rest of you, go ahead and close your eyes and bow your heads. And then say this after me. Jesus, I believe that you are God. I believe that you came as a man. I believe you died for my sins. I accept this gift of redemption and publicly declare you as my Lord and Savior. And if I have wandered, may I be restored in your grace. Amen. Amen. Congratulations. You have now been given that initial grace. Celebrate. Be overjoyed. You've entered into the kingdom of God now. And now, overflow in that grace so that it goes down to that next level. And you can have grace with the people in your life. And then it can overflow from there to go down to the next level to the people even further outside your circle. Until the point that you're like it says in the Bible with Jesus that he was full of grace and truth. So much that when people see you, they're just like, man, I love being around you. Thank you all so much. Have a blessed week. I look forward to seeing you guys next week.